Buonasera, buonasera. Ovviamente non sono il direttore Christian Greco, che anche se nella prima riga mi ha chiesto di fare l'introduzione, perché visto che io sono la curatrice responsabile per la collezione di papiri e oggi parla Reno Pietri, che sta lavorando con noi sui nostri papiri. Quindi è il mio piacere, grazie mille, di fare l'introduzione. E visto che la conferenza è in inglese, Parliamo un po' di inglese. Uh, so there we'll do the introduction in, in English. And I think uh, for the audience you have the translation. And uh, at least uh, since the conference is online in English, um, I will present briefly, it actually briefly, because I just printed nine pages of the curriculum. And as you can see, he's rather young, uh, but it's an impressive um, curriculum. No, but I will focus on the important parts. So Renaud was first trained in uh, art history and philology at the Ecole de Louvre at Paris. And then he defended his PhD on chariots in, Egyptian, in the Egyptian mind uh, in the New Kingdom at the University of Montpellier in France. In 2019, this is important also because he's actually collaborating with us, the Musée Dit, so just already for, yeah, for four more, quasi four years, because already in 2019 he took part in the EU project or funded project transforming the Egyptian Museum in Cairo as a project creator and coordinator working for the Musée du Louvre. So he was working for the Louvre, but since we are collaborating with the Louvre Berlin, uh, Leiden, and of course Cairo, we in Turin, he's already working for us for many years. But uh, luckily enough, we could, um, we could got him, get him from the uh, project. And since 2020, he is a postdoc researcher at the University of Liège in uh, the framework of, of the Crossing Boundaries project. And as you might have seen that he, but also me, we are wearing a t-shirt with Crossing Boundaries because actually today we had uh, unfortunately, the last Crossing Boundaries meeting. Uh, Crossing Boundaries is a project between the universities of Liège and Basel, and in collaboration with us, the Musée Egizio, and it's about papyri. And uh, actually, Renaud will present his lecture as part of uh, the Crossing, his Crossing Boundaries post-project, post-PhD, post-doc, post-PhD project. Um, in general, I mean, it's really many things that he is, uh, he is not just, as I said, a philologist, a linguist, papyrologist, but uh, working at the Musée du Louvre, he also has uh, a wide knowledge about, in general, uh, uh, ancient Egyptian artifacts. This is why he worked with the uh, European project on Cairo. But he's also working as an epigraph epigraphist and archaeologist uh, collaborating with the IFAO, but also for uh, in the tombs, but also for the Ostraka documentations with French, um, Swiss and uh, German colleagues, I think might be among them. But in general, it's I think I will stop at this point um, because it's really a long curriculum. And I just can say I'm looking forward to the conference because I know it will be interesting. Okay, thank you very much, Renaud. Uh, thank you, Suzanne. Thank you, Suzanne, and um, well, thank you very much for the invitation to the Museo Egizio and the ACME Association, and uh, to Christian uh, Greco and uh, Luigi Prada. Um, for this invitation. So today, uh, as uh, Suzanne um, uh, said, I will speak about my postdoc uh, research uh, in the framework of the Crossing Boundaries Project. Um, just a few words about this project, even if Suzanne already introduced it. Uh, it's a joint project between the Museo Egizio, the University of Liège, and the University of Basel. Uh, and I'm working in uh, this framework for the University of Liège um, since uh, already almost three years. So the project is about uh, the papyrological collection um, from the Al Medina kept in the Museo Egizio uh, that I will uh, present uh, quickly also to uh, recontextualize a bit uh, the collection. 
Uh, of course, this project is uh, deeply related also with the Turin Papyrus uh, online platform, uh, the database of um, uh, papyrus uh, fragments, uh, or papyrus in general, uh, of the Museo Egizio, as, I will, um, uh, as we will see together uh, further. So the corpus of uh, papyrus we are studying in this uh, project comes from the Medina in uh, Upper Egypt uh, on the west bank of uh, Thebes, uh, the ancient capital, and dates back to the Ram Ramesside period. Uh, you have here um, an, an image of, uh, um, of uh, the village of Dar Medina where the workers uh, were um, are living uh, uh, during the Ramesside period, so they were uh, the workers doing the um, uh, tombs of the Valley of the Kings, for instance, I mean, mostly. Um, here another view of, uh, of the Dar Medina uh, village and the necropolis uh, from the, the um, uh, excavation house uh, in the Al Medina itself. And the um, uh, papyrus were collected at the beginning of the 19th century uh, by Bernardino Drovetti, uh, most of them, uh, when he was uh, consul of France in uh, Egypt. And uh, he uh, sold the collection uh, in, the, in uh, 1824 uh, to the Museo Egizio. Uh, so it's mainly this collection that we are studying, uh, even if uh, later Ernesto uh, Schiaparelli uh, discovered more fragments that were probably from the same um, original uh, location or discovery. Uh, and uh, later, so at the end of, uh, of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, and then Bernard Brière um, for the IFAO, and the, um, for the IFAO. Uh, continued the work and discovered again some uh, small fragments. Uh, since uh, 2021, so last year, we are also um, trying to find uh, the original location of this papyrus archive um, with uh, Stefan Polis and Andreas Dorn, who are uh, the director of the mission uh, Amenart 5. So Amenart is uh, a scribe who um, probably was the owner of the private library, the archives uh, that are uh, now the um, papyrus collection in the Museo Egizio, or at least a large part of, um, of those papyrus. And uh, you have here in blue the location of the alleged uh, tomb of uh, Amenart V. Uh, who lived uh, during the, 20th, uh, the first part of the 20th uh, dynasty. Uh, here you have a view of, uh, quickly a view of the site, and uh, we are cleaning this area since two seasons now. Uh, here you have a plan of a, of a site with several uh, tombs and some substructures. Uh, I, I won't enter the detail uh, today, but uh, we already had some first results that were published online uh, this year. And um, what you can see here in blue is probably the original tomb of Amenart, uh, and allegedly the um, provenance uh, area of uh, some or most of the papyrus from this archive. Uh, and actually, when, uh, while cleaning the, this area, or I mean the area in general, we discovered some very small, tiny fragments of papyrus, which could uh, match with, uh, at least uh, from a paleographical, so uh, based on the handwriting, uh, which could match with um, some papyrus from Turin, even if we don't have any direct join yet. Um, so back to the collection of, uh, of the Museo Egizio. Um, I will discuss today mainly small fragments. Uh, well, you, you have different size, of course, but uh, the um, core of, uh, of the Museo Egizio collection, uh, I mean, the main documents are well known since uh, almost two centuries, or at least one century. You have here the strike papyrus, for, for instance, which is well preserved, and here 
um, a full column of uh, satirical letter of Ori, which, by the way, is based uh, is uh, is my um, main uh, postdoc project in in the framework of uh, crossing boundaries. Uh, but uh, in fact, we are more working with this kind of uh, stuff of uh, fragments, uh, which we uh, call the CP fragments in our own um, uh, project language. Uh, CP for Catalina Papiri, um, which basically uh, is a designation of uh, some folders uh, with thousands of fragments, so around uh, 12,000 uh, fragments uh, are kept in, uh, among the CPs. All of them comes from uh, the same um, a group of papyrus, or at least we think so. And one of the um, important research questions is to understand how many documents we had at the, uh, at the beginning before all these fragments uh, became fragments, or so before the documents were uh, destroyed in the antiquity, uh, or maybe uh, for some of them during the uh, uh, their travel from Egypt to, um, to Italy at the beginning of the 19th century. Uh, so there are uh, already dozens of documents identified, but among the potentially, you can consider that each fragment is a document uh, uh, starting from uh, zero. And the question we want to answer, among others, is how many documents uh, the archives of Amenart um, um, uh, how many documents compo composed the, the archives of Amen Uh If I show you some uh, examples, uh, well, you have different kind of uh, fragments and uh, different size of fragments in uh, in the corpus. Uh, in the in in the crossing boundaries project, the, um, the fragments are divided in two large categories. So. Uh, Basel is more working on the administrative stuff, uh, half of the fragments, let's say. Um, and uh, Liege is working on the other half, which is mainly literary stuff. But most of the fragments are, in, in fact, both literary and administrative because they are written on recto and verso. Uh, and it's, it's the kind of artificial um, division that, uh, that is a kind of Egyptological tradition let's say, but at the end, uh, you can have uh, some fragments of the same document in uh, both uh, large categories, uh, just because it depends uh, which side you are uh, considering the main to, to make your classification. So I will speak mainly about uh, fragments that I have been uh, studying a lot, so mainly the literary ones, or the so-called literary ones, but you will see that it's, it doesn't uh, really matter uh, in general. So here, for instance, you have some um, large fragments, um, or at, at least middle-sized fragments uh, among a CP, uh, CP166 in this case. And the image I am showing to you is a pre-restoration scan by the Museo Egizio. Um, because uh, one part of, uh, of, um, of the project is also, uh, was also to restore all the, um, the fragments. Uh, and the first images we had was uh, where there's, there's a huge uh, plate with many fragments. Uh, and I will come back to, to this uh, later, but the original, uh, I mean, this uh, view that you have is already a kind of classification of the fragments themselves uh, together. So you can have also some uh, even smaller fragments uh, uh, yeah, in, in good quantity and uh, what we can call also tiny fragments, but actually they are even smaller than that sometimes. Uh, I will mention some examples uh, later. And you can see that they are sometimes only um, preserving a, a few uh, signs uh, in hieratic, by the way. Uh, well, I didn't mention that, but everything is written in uh, hieratic, so the, the uh, cursive um, from New Kingdom in, in this case. And um, here you have the second uh, step. Uh, I mean, so the post-restoration scan, scan of each fragment. 
uh, with at left the recto and at right the verso of the, of the same uh, fragment. So you can see it's upside down because the, uh, the scribe, uh, I mean the second scribe, because it's not the same scribe on both uh, sides, who wrote the verso um, just um, turned the, um, the papyrus uh, upside down uh, before writing uh, the second text. Uh, here it's, for instance, a fragment uh, after restoration uh, with a high quality sc scan, and that's uh, typically this kind of images, image uh, that we use to, uh, to reconstruct the papyri and especially to uh, confirm the tests, uh, to confirm the joints that we, uh, we already tried based on the pre restoration uh, pictures. So I, I put some examples on you. I, I don't know if it's obvious for you, but uh, you, you may see that it's uh, each time the same uh, handwriting on both sides. So all this, uh, the three examples I will show, are from the same uh, original document. Uh, and you can see already that they, were, um, they, they, are numer they, they have a number uh, that reflects the fact that it comes from the same CP, so the same folder. And they were probably already um, identified as being part of the same document by previous scholar, scholars. Um, in fact, we are not working from zero because there, are, uh, there has been a lot of uh, scholars who uh, uh, worked on the collection. So, for instance, of course, Champollion himself and later um, um, Gardiner. Uh, and of course, um, Alessandro Rocati and uh, Sarah de Michelis, who did a lot of uh, work, um, especially among the fragments, to collect them and class them by uh, handwriting. So we are uh, also rela um, uh, following their own uh, steps. Uh, and you can see it uh, from the CPs because they are organized, the fragments are organized. Uh, at least in some cases, uh, in a kind of way that uh, doesn't um, let any doubt on the fact that the handwriting was identified as uh, uh, only one same handwriting for all the fragments in the same folder or at least uh, uh, for a group of fragments. I will show you an example uh, later. Uh, just uh, back to TPUP, so the online database, a, a huge part of the work is also to, uh, to um, put uh, in the database all the information we have about uh, each fragment, so one by one. Uh, I mean, the, the big part for, uh, for me, for instance, was the transcription from hieratic to uh, hieroglyphs. But um, the database also is, con um, it's, is uh, made to record all the material uh, data about each fragment, so the size of a fragment, um, the color of the ink, uh, the kind of uh, text which is uh, uh, written on each side. And uh, you can see that you have a, a full, uh, uh, a very detailed description for uh, the fragment itself, uh, the handwriting, and uh, the content, of course. Uh, all this um, information, of course, uh, forms um, some uh, clues to uh, gather fragments uh, and uh, join them into one single document in the future. And again, I will show you uh, an example later. Uh, one of the questions that we can ask about uh, this um, reconstru reconstruction work uh, on papyri is why we are doing this, uh, this um, uh, work. So, of course, the main point is to, to have a better understanding of the documents themselves. Um, it serves also some restoration purposes because at some point it means you can restore physically uh, the whole document starting from small fragments uh, that, that will um, join together. And um, we, um, even if we are dealing with small or middle sized fragments, it's sometimes also a way to identify new texts or new witnesses of a text uh, beside the huge uh, main documents that were already identified before. Uh, and when it's not uh, a, a new text, at least it can give a lot of uh, data, uh, new data, uh, and you have variations, so it can be many kinds of variation, but uh, you can imagine some lexical um, 
variations, grammatical variations, whatever, of the same text. I'm speaking mainly about uh, literary text, but for administrative uh, papyri, uh, of course, it's more, uh, you, you will have uh, a lot of data, and especially historical data, uh, even for small fragments. And of course, if you can uh, group or join together small fragments, it makes something bigger and more relevant. Um, the second point is that if we know how many documents and uh, how many scriptors and what was the contents of each document, we can have a better understanding, a better overview of the Dal Medina archives in general. So um, the private library of the scribes, of Amenart himself, of course, but even uh, uh, the other scribes by comparison, uh, at least we, we can know all the, the texts were circulating and uh, one of the main points with uh, reconstruction is that you will have um, a better idea of how many documents and so uh, what kind of, uh, what are the proportion of literary text, administrative text and uh, I mean different kind of um, variation copies of the same text and of course it's, it's, uh, it's uh, change, changes uh, completely the view you can have of uh, the global uh, archive uh, especially because the, um, even a small fragments can be another attestation, another occurrence of a, of a text. And at the end, of course, and that's uh, also the title of the Crossing Boundaries project, it's a way to have a better understanding of the Armenia itself, its written production and scribal practices in ancient Egypt in general. Uh, the more data you have, of course, uh, the more you can uh, say on these uh, aspects. Um, how do we proceed, or at least how do I proceed, um, to group the um, fragments together and to reconstruct papyri? Um, I would say my main um, approach is about paleography, so the handwriting of the scribes, the way the, the cursive is uh, traced, is, uh, is shaped. Uh, it can be first general features, like all the um, writing is bent, or how bold is it, um, and uh, well, the general shape of the handwriting of uh, a scribe on a fragment, uh, the, the shape of the signs themselves, or some group of signs, some very specific group of uh, signs. So you have um, some diagno diagnostic signs, uh, and by diagnostic signs I, I, I say um, I mean um, signs that will be uh, useful to identify the, the same handwriting, the same scribe in another fragment. Uh, well, I would say the, the diagnostic uh, signs are totally uh, are changing uh, um, for each fragment because actually it's the signs that are the more often uh, repeated in uh, all the, the, the uh, the more uh, atypical, the more specific uh, signs uh, that you can find. So it can be something very um, particular or something very um, uh, uh, current but that you will, uh, you will recognize because you, you saw it on several fragments. Uh, then the ductus, it's uh, uh, a bit the same, but it's more the way the uh, a sign is uh, traced, uh, is written, so each uh, stroke, stroke by stroke, and that's also something you can study to uh, identify uh, specific and writing. Um, paleography works also with materiality in general, so uh, you have the size, the shape of the fragments. Um, well. Uh, in many cases, you can recognize that uh, document uh, as fragments, uh, even if it's not well preserved. You, you will see that it's preserved in a, in a repetitive way, so you will have the same, um, more or less the same size or the same uh, width, or uh, something that will allow to, um, to uh, group fragments. Uh, the shape also is uh, some, some, sometimes uh, repeated. Um, well, it's, it's, it's not uh, a single, I mean, you, you need to mix, of course, all the clues together, but uh, the, the shape of a fragment itself can be repeated. And also, you can study the shape of, um, uh, of a break of, a, of the, the fragments, because uh, sometimes it's just matching uh, directly. 
um, the state of, of preservation, so it's a bit the same idea, but uh, also you can study the lacuna and themselves, so when you have some smaller holes in, uh, in the papyrus, um, uh, it can make some repeatable uh, patterns, and you can identify it to uh, group fra fragments. The color of the papyrus, it can uh, work, but you have also sometimes some uh, uh, fragments that are joining together and in a completely different color because, because of the modern history of the fragments. Um, of the fragments. Um, and then the content. Well, the content, it's, uh, it's also uh, most of the time very relevant, of course, because you can identify the type of text, the general type of text, and then um, uh, at least uh, group the fragments together. So it's already the case with administrative stuff and the literary uh, stuff in, uh, at some point. You can also identify a precise text and with known uh, parallels, which will uh, be very helpful, of course, to position, to place the fragments uh, based on this parallel. I will show you uh, an example just after. And uh, you have also identified patterns, so repetitive expressions or, uh, or grammatical uh, um, uh, expressions that you, you, you can um, uh, find in some specific text and that will uh, lead you to, uh, to make a, a proper reconstruction, reconstruction. Layout, of course, is another, um, another clue and specific spellings because, of course, uh, uh, a scribe can have uh, some uh, particular habits in spellings or besides uh, its own uh, handwritings uh, and paleography. Uh, this, lead, this leads to um, make some fragments, uh, some clusters of fragments that are allegedly from the same document. It's mainly, I mean, uh, at least for me, it's mainly based on paleographical consideration at the beginning, so I would call it paleographical uh, clusters. And then you can play with the fragments uh, to, uh, to try if you can find direct joints. Um, of course, if you have direct joints, uh, you have a confirmation that your uh, methodology and the, the, the handwriting you identified uh, is indeed uh, a common handwriting for at least uh, some fragments, and that uh, you are not, uh, I mean, uh, um, you, you can begin at least to, to make a, a, a document, and you will see later if, of course, the, the other fragments can match or not uh, based on all the, the clues I mentioned. Um, well, you have to imagine that the, the Turin collection is like a very large puzzle, but you, you take, actually, you take a lot of different puzzles, which are the documents, and you put everything together, and then you, retire, you, you just put out uh, half of a puzzle, let's say. So those are the missing fragments that we will never uh, find again. But uh, it's really a kind of uh, endless puzzle uh, that you have to complete uh, document by document. Um, I will discuss now a case study, which is uh, a, a, a duplicate of some magical text uh, that is known on the verso of a papyrus uh, Chester BT 9, uh, a papyrus which is um, now in the um, uh, British Museum in London, and uh, it was published by uh, Alan Gardiner in uh, 1935 uh, with a, a hieroglyphic transcription. And actually, the Chester BT9 uh, duplicates, because there are several, so I will discuss only one, but there are several in the, in the Museo Egizio, um, were uh, identified uh, first by Alessandro Rocchetti, uh, who uh, published some of, uh, some of the fragments and um, uh, indicated, mentioned uh, some of, uh, of the others. Uh, in this specific case, it's... Um, it's uh, those fragments uh, at right that were um, mentioned in uh, 1975. So you can see that we have three fragments and they are already um, uh, positioned like they, they are supposed to be based on the, um, on the known uh, version uh, from uh, London, uh, so based on the content. And you can see that they were grouped together probably based on the, 
on the paleography and the handwritings. So at left, uh, actually, it's another version of the same text, but with another uh, handwriting um, that uh, is uh, preserved on, uh, under the same uh, plate, uh, glass plate. Um, here you can see the, oops, here you can see the verso, and uh, well, you can see the difference between uh, left and right. So of course, we have to reverse uh, if you compare with the previous uh, slide. But uh, the paleographical cluster at left is written on the verso, while the other uh, part is not. So uh, it's two different documents, uh, but with the same uh, text, at least on the recto, because the text on the verso is uh, something different. Um, well, based on, um, on the study of the paleography, the materiality, and the content, we can reconstruct a large part of, uh, of this document. So first, you can observe that the, uh, the handwriting is literary, so uh, it's something you can really uh, read easily, uh, let's say, um, even if some literary handwritings are not so easy to read. But, um, and the, the content is literary also, so it's parallel to the text D of uh, Papyrus Chester BC 9 Verso, which is a, a book of protection, according with Gardiner, so a magical or ritual um, text uh, that is mentioning uh, a lot of deities uh, prote protecting um, uh, the, the one to, to, a, to whom the text is dedicated. Uh, from a paleographical point of view, we can uh, generally um, speak about the, the handwriting as a fine and quick uh, handwriting. Uh, which is, by, uh, um, by the way, probably the same on the recto and on the verso, even if it's a bit uh, quicker uh, on, the, on the recto. Uh, it's slightly bent, bent to the right, um, and uh, that's all. You can see from a material point of view that the text is palimpsest, so it was uh, written before this text and then uh, erased. Uh, and uh, you, you can really read uh, some signs of, um, uh, of a previous text uh, easily. Uh, well, I don't think it's exactly the same uh, on writing for the previous text, but that's another question. Uh, and that's something important, of course, because if you, uh, if you are looking for other fragments, you will be looking for other fragments which are also palimpsest uh, among the CP's uh, folders. Uh, well, from a material point of view, you can note also that the recto and the verso are, are uh, written, inscribed, and uh, you can note the same top-down orientation, and uh, based on the reconstruction, but it's already obvious based on this, um, this, uh, fra this fragments, uh, it's a half roll uh, format, so it's less than 20 centimeters uh, eight. Um, well, I, will, um, I was uh, looking at the CPs when I, I first uh, worked on this um, papyrus, uh, on this document, and actually um, there are two different uh, paleographical clusters, but that were um, done by previous scholars among the CPs. Uh, you can see all the fragments that are uh, in red here. Uh, that in, in fact belong to the same uh, document, uh, you will see it just after, and uh, it was probably uh, grouped like that because of the handwriting. Uh, so the, the first part of the reconstruction was, let's say, not easy, but at least you have uh, a lot of fragments already grouped together by previous uh, scholars in the past. And then you uh, have to find uh, the parallel uh, in uh, Gardiner's publication and to find, to find where are uh, the fragments uh, based on the content. And it appears that with uh, that, so in green you have everything that is preserved in this uh, Turing version, it, ap it appears that if you, um, if you do such a comparison, you will be able to reconstruct at least uh, almost a column. Uh, so everything in red is uh, new fragments added to the um, CGT uh, 54057 uh, first three fragments uh, that you have in blue. And you can see that we have at least two columns uh, that are preserved. 
uh, based uh, on the comparison with, uh, with Gardiner. And what is interesting also is that uh, the text is very, very uh, comparable. You don't have a lot of variation. It's, it's really close to the uh, London version, uh, except that it's, it's a bit, um, uh, it's slightly uh, different in terms of uh, layouts or spellings at some point. So uh, you have a, a colon, uh, I mean, the beginning of colon X, plus two is indeed the end of the previous colon in the London version. Um, and by the way, you have also some uh, isolated uh, fragments that you can uh, find. So based on the handwriting, again, you will try to find uh, the solution in, the, in Gardiner's publication. Uh, and uh, actually, all those fragments can be uh, more or less um, attributed to uh, another uh, colon of a text, which is very interesting because we have a lot of colon missing in between uh, what I show you here and this column, but probably the original uh, document was larger with, uh, with more uh, fragments and, uh, and complete, if, uh, if we can say so, uh, compared with uh, the London version. But in fact, there is uh, something else about this uh, specific version because if you compare some, uh, some diagnostic uh, groups of uh, signs, uh, like swab and um, so in, in uh, on the top and uh, at the bottom, uh, who to, uh, these groups are very, very similar uh, in terms of unwritings uh, and ductus. So I think we can uh, just say it's probably the same scriptor, so the same scribe who wrote the Chester BT9 papyrus and this version of the same text in Turin. And of course, it opens a lot of uh, questions in terms of uh, uh, circulation of a text uh, and in copies and, uh, and even uh, in terms of uh, relationship between different archives because the Chester BT uh, archive is supposed to be different than the uh, Amenart one. But it's something also that was um, highlighted before by uh, Rocati that uh, we have a lot of copies of the same uh, magical texts and especially uh, Chester BT texts except that if uh, that here the copy is by the same scribe, so it's uh, something very interesting. Well, and here you have a comparison in between the two same passages uh, in both uh, documents, and I think it's quite uh, clear that uh, it's the same uh, scribe. Well, I, I won't enter into the detail, but you have slight, uh, you have uh, small variations in between both versions, and especially some uh, errors or some, yeah, some mistakes uh, in the London version that are um, uh, sometimes, but not, uh, not uh, always, uh, corrected in the, uh, in the Turin version. So I still have to study it uh, a bit more to know if, uh, what is the relationship between both documents and uh, why the scribe decided to write twice the same uh, text. Uh, actually, this uh, papyri reconstruction uh, works also with uh, small fragments, small isolated fragments, and uh, sometimes you don't have at all any parallel, so you just uh, will find joints in between two fragments, and it's the beginning of a new document, and you never know how it will um, continue. But you have plenty of fragments in the same CPs uh, first, so that's the, most, uh, the simplest uh, join, uh, joints to do. Uh, that match together, so we don't really know when the fragments were uh, separated, uh, maybe in the modern history of, uh, of a papyrus, but um, even, uh, even in the same, uh, in the same uh, folder like that, you can find direct join very uh, often and uh, begin a new document. Uh, so I put, you, I, I, I put some examples on, in the PowerPoint. You have, uh, well, I mean, some uh, obvious joints that, that can appear um, when you are looking uh, most of the time for something else, but anyway. Uh, and you see that you can, like that, reduce the number of isolated fragments and uh, in, uh, improve the document reconstruction step by step. Here also it's the case with uh, some fragments in the same uh, plate. So you have two uh, different uh, groups that belong to two distinct, uh, distinct documents. 
Uh, and also sometimes you can recognize that you have a fragment that will match with another one, but in another CP. So that's uh, more complicated because you have to keep in mind the handwriting uh, of each uh, fragment. And basically it's a question of uh, paleographical or visual culture. So you train your eyes and uh, at some point you will recognize uh, a few uh, handwritings. And uh, well, most of the time it's also a question of chance because you, you are uh, searching for another document and you will uh, try some uh, joints and sometimes it works. Uh, so here you have a, an, an example. Um, there are many uh, small joints like that in, uh, in, the, um, in the collection that we can uh, make. And uh, I mean, my own methodology is to try to gather all the fragments uh, based on the paleography, as I said. So here, for instance, you have a kind of paleographical cluster. Uh, so each fragment that I think could uh, match in terms of handwriting on, uh, on each side is, um, is uh, uh, grouped with the others uh, using uh, Photoshop, as I will show. And you can see that uh, they are not uh, really organized except the, uh, the one uh, at the top. Uh, some of them comes from the same CP, but uh, other ones are uh, from different uh, folders. And uh, sometimes you can have really uh, a lot of different fol folders. Uh, I, I will give you some example after, but it's, uh, it, it's really um, not random, but uh, still. And so here, for instance, you had, you had uh, two preliminary paleographical clusters that indeed match together based on the writing on recto and verso, even if you can see the verso here. And uh, beside that, some small fragments isolated in other CPs, other folders that uh, can be uh, from the same scribe and so from the same document. Uh, well, I have several examples like that. Here you have, for instance, uh, a magical uh, text. Uh, uh, and you can see that it match uh, both on recto and verso. I mean, of course, uh, most of the time you try one side and you, you will confirm with, uh, confirm with the other side, especially when you have a text. Uh, and here it's the perfect case of um, a text that is uh, hetero hetero heterogenic. Uh, so you have um, a magical text on the recto and uh, an administrative text on the verso. And the writing itself uh, is, uh, is very uh, recognizable. Uh, I mean, the one on the recto. Uh, and belongs to a larger group of fragments uh, for which I have many different subclusters based on the verso because the verso differs. So if you have a different verso, it can be the same document with different text and verso, or it can be also different documents. Uh, I still have to work on this uh, uh, cluster especially. But you can see that uh, with uh, only a few fragments, you can go, you can go uh, to, to larger and larger documents. And if you find the parallel, of course, it's easier. Um, just to mention also some uh, specific cases that are maybe uh, more uh, interesting in terms of content uh, and documents. Uh, I uh, recently did this join. Uh, you can see again the recto and the verso, and on the recto, uh, it's uh, part of, uh, of a miscellanies, uh, so uh, literary text that, that we call uh, miscellanies, and especially it's a partial copy of uh, Papyrus Anastasi III. Uh, and actually, the, the text gives some uh, lexical variations, uh, so I was able, able to do the join uh, mainly because of your writing on the, the red um, uh, henna jet in the mid middle of the fragment. Uh, and it matched also on the verso. And actually, based on the writing, we can uh, put this uh, group of two fragments. Uh, we can uh, um, associate it to a larger document that is uh, CGT 54038. Uh, which was already identified as uh, miscellanies and published, by the way, for most of the fragments. Well, you have different handwritings on this uh, plate, but at least the one on the left are the same as the fragments uh, identified. And 
the position of the fragment is not uh, fully uh, certain, but it should be around this uh, position. Uh, and hopefully I will find more join or someone will, uh, will find more join in the future. But in this case, for instance, it's a known text. You can check uh, where, uh, where to place it. And uh, also it gives a lot of new data uh, about variations of, uh, of this text and, uh, and uh, other uh, stuff like that. Um, among the most famous papyrus uh, I found some joined uh, with, um, you have uh, the Tutmose in uh, Syria uh, literary text, which is a kind of uh, a literary text inspired by the Battle of Kadesh uh, poem, uh, or at least uh, very close in terms of content. And one of the most uh, famous, from the, at least for me, from the Meso Egizio. And actually, I put this example because you can see that even uh, very small, very tiny fragments can be sometimes uh, joined together, uh, like that, uh, and then uh, joined with uh, larger fragments. In this case, it's uh, interesting because the join was uh, it was in completely different group of fragments. Uh, uh, so you can see CP 156 and 111, but it's very recognizable. The handwriting is very recognizable. And you can see also that we have a part of a cartouche, a royal cartouche. Uh, so you just have to find a uh, 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 text uh, where it's missing. And actually, it's missing on this uh, fragment of uh, Tutmosi in uh, Syria uh, papyrus. And you can see that uh, there is also another fragment that I added uh, later, uh, just below, based on the writings uh, first. And it's in this uh, very specific case, it's of course, uh, well, very interesting. I mean, the small fragments are more uh, anecdotic, but still they can play a role in a larger uh, reconstruction in the future because they are, uh, I mean, they are playing the role of an interface with more fragments potentially. So you can add uh, again and again uh, more pieces to the puzzle. But if you take the, the lower um, fragment, uh, it's uh, kind of substantial. So you, you can improve your reading of uh, well-known text, by the way, uh, by adding uh, fragments to it. And even if it's well studied since uh, at least uh, uh, almost one century, it's uh, the kind of progress we can do thanks to, to this project. Uh, and by the way, I discovered more fragments that probably belong to the same um, papyrus, even if it's, it has to be confirmed because you don't have any direct join, but still uh, the handwriting is uh, working on both sides and the content also uh, is uh, about uh, the art of uh, someone and uh, probably the king and it would match uh, very, um, I, it would match uh, with um, with this text, this literary text. Uh, maybe some future joints will uh, add data to, to this reconstruction. Um, well, uh, just to quickly show some, uh, let's say, more impressive uh, reconstruction, uh, I have worked for my um, postdoc uh, project mainly on the satirical letter of Hori, which is uh, one of the most popular literary texts in the Ramesside period. Um, and um, I have worked on this specific um, uh, papyrus that were published uh, in the past by uh, Caminos, uh, a scholar who worked mainly on um, uh, preliminary transcription by uh, Alan Gardiner and who published uh, most of those fragments uh, that you can see now at the screen. And then uh, Hans Werner Fischer Alfert um, published also uh, its own uh, translation of the text and so on in his um, synoptical edition of uh, this specific text. Uh, well, just to recontextualize, it's one of the, we don't have a lot of uh, version of his text on papyrus, so uh, the reference uh, text is the Papyrus Anastasi I in the, in the British Museum in London, which is more or less uh, complete. Uh, and so we can, of course, check uh, the, um, this parallel text. And uh, beside that, we have dozens of Ostraka with uh, 
more, most of the time the same uh, passages. So each uh, witness on Papyrus is uh, interesting in itself, let's say. And each fragment you can add, of course, add uh, new variations uh, on, on Papyrus uh, versions. So here it's the or original state of the Papyrus at the beginning of the project. And now uh, I added the few uh, fragments uh, which can be positioned uh, surely, because beside that you have uh, other fragments that I will show just after. But you can see that we can, uh, most of the fragments are joining uh, with already identified fragments, uh, or can be positioned in, uh, virtual, uh, in the virtual reconstruction in specific columns uh, based on the, on the text. Uh, the handwriting is very recognizable also. But uh, what is interesting here is that it gives uh, variations, and specifically uh, lexical variations, uh, about words that are attested maybe twice or uh, three times in, in, um, uh, in ancient Egyptians. So you can have at least one more uh, attestation, and in itself, it's something interesting. And you have also a huge variation in terms of um, uh, uh, the a sequence of uh, paragraphs, uh, because the same paragraph, for instance, is repeated twice in this uh, very specific version, uh, which is something I still have to explain, but anyway, it's uh, an interesting, uh, interesting uh, feature. Uh, beside this, uh, these columns uh, that belong to the um, middle part of the text, you have uh, very small fragments that were dissemin disseminated in different uh, folders, in different CPs. Uh, that ca you can see now uh, on the screen. Um, well, some of them are easy to uh, position again because you, you can recognize the, the parallel text from Anastasi 1, and some others are probably variations but that are not contextualized, so that's, that's very diffi difficult to, uh, to know from which part of the document uh, they come. But for instance, uh, the fragment uh, 2C comes from the um, eighth, uh, uh, no, from, um, from few columns uh, before what we, we had uh, just here. Uh, so it's interesting because it's, um, it means that probably the document was really, really uh, more complete that, uh, than what it, it is uh, now. And you have also fragment 2 uh, uh, to Q and to R that comes really from the um, first uh, pages, at least uh, the first 10 uh, columns of, uh, of Papyrus Anastasi 1, if you check the parallel. So it means you really have um, some uh, witness of uh, the former, uh, I mean the original, uh, uh, columns that almost are completely disappeared, but still each small fragment can be useful. Uh, if I take uh, the second version of a satirical letter of Ori, which is already also in, in Papyrus, it was published by the same uh, scholars before, uh, and you can see the, the handwriting that is uh, completely different. Uh, it's a very regular and recognizable also handwriting um, of Ramside Times. And uh, this specific version, um, well, it has another part of a text which is, uh, uh, another part of a document which, is, uh, which belongs to the end of uh, Anastasi 1, uh, of a satirical letter of Oi. Uh, so it means that we are missing uh, already uh, a few columns in between. But um, I was able to add also some small fragments. And here again, it gives uh, variations, uh, variations that are most of the time already attested, but in Ostraka versions, and uh, that are, of course, interesting to study uh, in itself. So that's a work in progress, of course, and uh, just to, to let you know, I identified uh, less than two days ago uh, a small fragment that belongs to, uh, to this um, group of fragments. Uh, just to mention quickly also some uh, work in progress that were done by uh, my colleagues in the framework of uh, crossing boundaries. You can see here the Brontologion, so a kind of handbook um, about uh, divination by Fender. Uh, that was published previously by uh, Alessandro Rocati, uh, or at least mentioned, and uh, that is under reconstruction, under study uh, by Stefan Polis and Natalie Sojic right now. 
uh, well, it's a different case because uh, the text organizations allow uh, more um, precise reconstructions uh, because it's uh, using the calendar, so you can, of course, follow the dates uh, and the, the clues uh, for each um, uh, date to uh, reconstruct uh, the sequence of uh, fragments uh, and columns. Uh, so here you have a verso also. The text is on both recto and verso. And here the suggestion of uh, reconstruction by uh, Stefan uh, Polis and Nathalie Sojic. Uh, and you can see that uh, here the reconstruction is, uh, I, I would not say easier, but I mean it's not based on the same, um, the same uh, main um, tool or, or clue. Uh, it's mostly about the content uh, and uh, especially about the, the dates. Uh, you have the same kind of, uh, of things with this uh, journal of Ramses III and Ramses IV, that is understood by Matthias Müller, Stefan Polis, and Philip Zayer. And here again, it's uh, at least in the recto, it's a journal, so you will have uh, dates and you can reconstruct, uh, because of the dates, the whole seconds and add uh, dozens of fragments that you identified first based on the handwritings. Uh, well, the state of reconstruction uh, is not the latest one, so I, uh, I know that uh, there are more fragments than that. Um, another uh, group of fragments that is interesting to mention is uh, the prohibitions. So that's a special case because um, in this very specific case we were able to identify the text based on the content, uh, you can see that there is this uh, red um, expression that is repeated in between uh, all the fragments, and that is a characteristic of a specific literary texts, the, pro the, the prohibitions that were, um, uh, I mean, all the versions, the copies we have on Ostraka were published by Fred Hagen uh, a few years ago, uh, well, years ago. Uh, and the text is uh, well known for this uh, red uh, incipit uh, for each prohibition, so it, it means uh, don't do uh, this kind of uh, thing. And um, the, um, well, I mean, it's more a question of uh, layout and, uh, and uh, content uh, to identify the, the handwriting, especially because the fragments are sometimes very small, uh, small and uh, only, uh, the only uh, clue you have uh, of the content is this red uh, expressions. And we were able to make some small joints already in between the fragments. There are more fragments uh, in, uh, in general. Um, in, in this case, it's also interesting because it's the first uh, attestation of a text on papyrus, and uh, also the preserved part of the text is not at all attested in the uh, Ostraka versions. So uh, it's, it really uh, brings more data to the study of uh, this literary uh, text or group of texts, uh, even if the fragments are uh, small or, let's say, uh, not uh, um, a part of a very large uh, papyrus. Uh, in the same uh, kind of ID, you, we um, uh, identified um, a new witness of the, Amenemope, of the teachings of Amenemope, a very famous uh, literary text also, that is on the recto of this fragment, so you can see here. And uh, in, this, uh, in this case, it's also interesting because it's probably one of the most, uh, the earliest attestation of uh, the text based on uh, the paleography. It probably belongs to the end of the uh, 20th dynasty, uh, but we still have a lot of uh, things to, to study about this fragment. And uh, during um, our research in, among the CPs, we were able to identify two very small fragments that you have on the screen, and it's really the typical case where you can um, find small fragments that, that will bring a lot of uh, data because they actually uh, uh, belong to other parts of the uh, teaching of Amenemope and probably at least for one of them to the column just uh, before. And they um, uh, allow us to uh, propose uh, that the text was uh, uh, at least um, more complete than the single uh, fragment we had. But Till now, it's the only fragments we identified uh, of this specific handwriting. Uh, yeah. Well, 
one of my last uh, example is this uh, group of, um, of um, uh, fragments that were uh, already uh, numbered as a, as a group, uh, CGT 54059. They all belong to the same document based on the writing and the content. And you can see they were uh, more or less positioned also uh, by Alessandro Catti, I guess, um, in the past. Um, and I think he identified the text, of course, because if you can position it, it means you identified the parallel. And in this case, it's a well-known uh, text, um, a magical text against scorpions and uh, snakes um, uh, bits that, uh, that is uh, about uh, identifying each um, body part of a patient to uh, a deity that will protect uh, who will protect uh, this specific body part based on uh, what plays or um, um, religious uh, allusions. Uh, anyway, this text, this kind of text is well attested uh, in the Ramesside uh, um, uh, times. And uh, it's also, um, like uh, the prohibition, by the way, it's also a text that has, that has a very repetitive pattern in red. Uh, that allows, uh, of course, us to identify the text, but also that makes the reconstruction easier because you can know uh, at least where are the beginnings of each uh, sentence and uh, try to, uh, to position the fragments uh, uh, on the document. So I was able to find uh, more fragments, and here you have the current state of reconstruction of the papyrus. Um, of course, it's only uh, 20 small fragments in total, but you can see that already we can have uh, the, um, we, we have uh, traces of three pages that are, uh, that correspond to a sequence based on the parallels. Um, and in this case also, it's uh, interesting because the, the best parallel we have uh, dates back to the Ptolemaic period, so it's a very, very late, uh, uh, version of the text, but um, still, I mean, uh, uh, if you compare with uh, the other Ramesside uh, period, the, the Ptolemaic one is the closest to this, uh, this fragment. Or here in this drawing, you can see also that um, at some point you have also to give up in the positioning without new, new joints because uh, for all the fragments with small arrows, it means that it can move a bit. Uh, on a vertical or horizontal axis because uh, the content is helpful, but uh, because of variation between different versions of the text, you can be sure it's really exactly uh, at this, um, uh, you, can re you can be sure of the position. And um, well, I will say you, you always have uh, other clues like the fibers or even the, um, uh, yeah, the fibers or even uh, the detail of, um, of the size of uh, each line and so on. But uh, at some point, it's too complicated to, um, without new joints. Um, well, all these joints, so all these uh, uh, re reconstructions uh, are documented also uh, in TIPUP at uh, a special uh, level that we call the document level. Um, which uh, you, you, so you have, a, um, you have an, um, an example uh, on your screen, um, on the screen. Uh, each document has a, a proper number, and uh, of course we can uh, propose uh, for, for each document the list of uh, objects uh, of CP fragments uh, that belongs to the document. So uh, in this special case, it's the magical text I just showed, uh, you can see the list. In fact, you have mixed uh, the joining fragments, the directly joining fragments, and the fragments that are allegedly from the same document based on the content of your writings. Um, because, of course, you will have, like, uh, usually floating fragments, so fragments you can't position, but that are probably from the same document based on all the other uh, clues. And uh, this kind of uh, list, of course, is uh, documented in a more detailed way with all the uh, motivation or the reason why we uh, propose this join. Um, and that's uh, something that is uh, allowed by uh, TPUP. Uh, 
and that is of course very precious because you can uh, record all the joints you do uh, even if it's not the main uh, the main document you are studying uh, step by step uh, yeah so here for instance you have an example uh, where uh, I precise that there, has, there are no uh, direct join which means it's based mainly on, uh, on paleography but with all the direct join identified it suggests that probably the paleographical um, uh, clue is a, a good one. Uh, to conclude this, uh, um, to conclude, I will mention um, quickly the, um, the tools we use. Uh, well, till now I, I'm mostly using Adobe Photoshop to uh, reconstruct this uh, fragment. So you can see it's uh, really a, a working area where you put every uh, fragment, uh, you copy and paste every uh, fragment individually. Uh, and at left, you can see the recto, at right, the, uh, the verso, uh, because you need, of course, both uh, sides to, um, to compare uh, the patterns and the writings to be sure it's, it belongs to the same um, document. And step by step, you will, uh, so here it's uh, separation. Uh, step by step, you will uh, try and, uh, and propose reconstruction. Uh, of course, the tool is very useful, but uh, it's a very complicated uh, software for, uh, for what we uh, do, and it's not very adapted uh, so far. So one of the biggest uh, points uh, in the framework of, uh, of the Crossing Boundaries project is also that uh, our colleague uh, Stefan Hunter um, is developing a special tool, the virtual light table, to, um, to make the reconstruction in a better way and uh, to make it easier, of course, uh, also. Uh, you can see here a, a first uh, view of, of one of the first versions. So I won't uh, enter into the details, but I, will I would like to thank um, Stefan for the slides he provided, to me, he provided uh, for this talk. And you can see that the, the, um, uh, this uh, specific tool will be very useful for us because you have every kind of uh, needed uh, uh, um, um, yeah, tool, like you can measure the, measure the fragments, uh, annot annotate uh, each uh, reconstruction, you can play with the fragments, and especially you can play with the recto on the verso by flipping uh, each fragment. Uh, and you can add uh, all the fragments you want. It's directly related also to the TPUB database, or at least it, it will take the, uh, it, it will use uh, the fragments uh, from the database. Uh, you can re uh, record everything, and uh, all the, um, the functions uh, that are now uh, available will be improved in the future, in the next few months, I guess, because it's still in. Uh, development, but uh, already the first version we tried is, uh, is very uh, useful. Um, well, I won't, uh, I won't say too much about it, but you can see here on the, um, the roadmap uh, of a virtual light table that uh, probably next year we will have some uh, wonderful tool to uh, keep going with our constructions. And uh, well, I can't wait to test some uh, joints with that. Um, well, what's next, except the development of, uh, of this specific tool? I think, of course, uh, one of the main points, as I said at the beginning, is the physical reconstruction of a papyri, because if you have a virtual one, you can uh, begin to uh, uh, make the papyrus anew from the, uh, the virtual uh, reconstructions. Another point is uh, the extension of the corpus, because of course this collection of papyri from the Almedina, um, we uh, have other papyri in other collections, especially in the IFAO, uh, where Breyer um, uh, for, for, put uh, the fragments he discovered. And uh, we already know that there are some joining fragments between the IFAO uh, collection and the uh, Turin one. Uh, thanks to the Book of the Dead of Baki and also uh, the Stato Civile uh, fragments. Uh, so this kind of connections means that we expect uh, that some joints will be possible in between the Ifao collection and the Turin one at some point. 
Uh, the edition of, of uh, all these new documents and new fragments joined to uh, already known documents, of course, it's uh, uh, one of the main uh, things we will have to do in the future in general. And uh, all of this new data will help to have a better general overview of the Dal Medina archives in general. Uh, well, I will uh, quote to, uh, to conclude Alan Gardiner, who said uh, a long time ago, when, one century ago, that, uh, of course, you have a, a lot of uh, very fragmentary fragments, but still, uh, if we uh, handle the collection systematically, we can do uh, really some great uh, progress in our understanding of uh, collection. And here at the whole team of Crossing Bondi's project <laughs> and the picture we took. So that's the best reconstruction we did so far with all the fragments of papyrus in each uh, T-shirt. <laughs> And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Renaud. Um, are there any questions, comments, domande, commenti? Because we also have, I mean, I hope not comments from the colleagues of Crossing Boundaries sitting here, but uh, forse dei pubblico in generale, anche in italiano, francese, tedesco e inglese, basta. No, perfect conference. No questions, no comments. Allora, thank you very much again. Grazie mille Renaud, e grazie a lei. Eh, buona serata. And, uh, yeah. Ci vediamo alla prossima conferenza anche fra poco, credo. Grazie. Thank you.